All right, friends, welcome again. Uh, I'm still in Hawaii. Uh, a friend asked me if, um, if the background was actually real, and I can assure you it really is. You might be able to, uh, to see some uh, rustations or really crustaceans walking around me uh, at some point. I, I spotted one earlier. So this is all this is all real. I'm still in, in Hawaii. I just got vaccinated for the second time. So um, I'm in a, in an excellent mood today, and I figured I'd make another little video. It might be the last video in the series. We'll see. We'll see about that. But um, let's just uh, dive right into it. So let's see if I can do this without having my laptop wobble too much. So yeah, this might be a bit of a wrap-up video. Um, I think that I kind of accomplished accomplished some of the goals. Uh, well, let's let's reflect on on that uh, later. One of the things I've been mostly thinking about recently is what would it actually take to adopt um, for people to adopt these new methods that we've been looking at, right? These new methods for high-performance graphical user interfaces. And there's a couple of things, right? So I think one of them, at least for the short term, is backwards compatibility, right? I think it's quite important that um, you can use whatever is new together with um, uh, the code that you already have. Uh, otherwise, it will be just extremely niche, right? It will be only people who have such a big need for performance that it really doesn't matter to them that they have to rewrite everything from scratch. And that will be a tall order for most people. Another thing is, will this new method have enough APIs, right? Um, and that basically means, yeah, like if you're going to rewrite something like Slack, say, right, or Discord um, in this new system, you really want there to be like video uh, playback uh, and images and uh, ideally also um, uh, uh, video calls with other people. So there's a lot of these things that the web gives you right now. Um, and the market will just be very small if you have to compromise on, on a lot of them. And then, of course, for production applications, robustness is very important, right? So having, like building your software on top of things that are not very well tested and so on is not a great business decision necessarily. Again, it might be okay for um, for people for who performance really matters so much that they're willing to compromise a bit on this, but it will be it will be a pretty niche, uh, pretty small market. And then another thing that is quite important, I think, is uh, can it be easily debugged, right? So the debugging tools that we have now, and not just debugging, but also like analytics, error reporting, testing, right? A lot of these things are very mature in today's ecosystem, especially on the web, but also for native applications. And, uh, and so that, that's quite important. And then finally, I think uh, it's especially interesting to look at mobile, right? I mentioned this a couple of times before, but uh, mobile applications run into performance constraints much more quickly than, uh, than most other applications. And so um, anything that we can do to, to work well on mobile would be, um, um, w you know, would, would certainly see an interesting market there. So I then want to kind of go through a couple of different approaches that I see, right? So uh, what we settled on so far is MakePad, right? Like MakePad seems to be doing everything kind of in the way that I uh, uh, imagine the future would hold. Um, by the way, I, I did play a little bit with Flutter. It turns out they don't have 3D support, right? So Flutter doesn't have 3D support, so they already fill in the enough APIs um, category, at least for, for my purposes. So anyway, uh, MakePad does most of the things I wanted to do, but if we rank it in, um, in terms of these items, there's clearly also a lot of work to be done. And, you know, just to be clear here, I don't want to ding, you know, the MakePad developers by any means. I think it's incredible what they've achieved so far. Um, but I think it is important to kind of see what their path towards um, more broad-scale adoption would look like. 
so backwards compatibility, right? So um, certainly it's possible to bring in like existing C++ or Rust libraries, but I'm mostly thinking here about JavaScript and DOM uh, type applications. And I think it can be done, right? Like on the WASM target, you can kind of do overlays, I guess, of, um, of DOM elements. In, it's not really supported right now. There's not anything uh, to make this easy, but I think it would fit, um, it, it could fit sort of in, in the current render structure. Um, it would only work on the WASM target, uh, sort of out of the box though. Uh, well, still not out of the box, but in, in any sort of easy way. Uh, because there you just have a browser, right? And so you can just run the JavaScript code and the CSS and the DOM stuff and whatever and layer uh, on top of it. So it's, it's kind of possible. It's not really anything that they support right now, but it's not too hard to do. Um, then in the Enough APIs um, category, I think it can be tricky, right? So there's no APIs for image rendering or media. And media is going to be tricky on the web because we don't have any, um, like the APIs that you can currently use on the web all basically require that you use the DOM. Uh, there's uh, a new standard in development called Web Codex, which will um, expose some of this stuff a bit more low level and you can hopefully use it in WebAssembly then. Uh, but right now that is not a thing. The 3D rendering is a little bit limited, right? So you can only render triangles and sort of like the blend mode is hard coded. Like there's a bunch of stuff hard coded, uh, which is fine, it can be extended, but any new uh, APIs for, for other kind of rendering that they don't have right now, you would have to implement in all the different backends, right? And so that is quite a bit of work and potentially can be, I don't know, hard to, um, hard to maintain as well uh, or hard to make stable. And then you can use existing libraries for various native APIs. Um, so if you care about native APIs that don't um, necessarily run on the web, then you can just use whatever is there in Rust already. Um, but it's a bit more work maybe to support things both on the web and natively, although um, support in Rust for that might be growing. Um, sort of independently of Makepad anyway. So I don't think that there's like any in inherent blockers here for, for getting the right APIs, um, except what I just mentioned with video. Um, but it is a lot of work. There's a lot of work still here to be done, I think. Okay, so let's look at robustness. So I think this is the piece where Makepad has the longest way to go, right? So they reinvented everything, which on the one hand means that the system is easy to understand, but it also means that there's a lot of opportunities for things to have bugs and they are dog fooding their own product. So it's clearly robust enough for that, but they don't have any other users. So, um, they, when I played with it, there's definitely bugs or weird things here and there. Um, and I haven't exercised the code base that, that much yet, uh, myself. Um, and so it will take a while and there's, there's no tests. Um, it leaks memory currently. There's a bunch of things here that need to be fixed. Uh, even if there are tests for Makepad, there's no story yet for how you can uh, properly test your application, right? Um, so things like, um, um, integration testing or testing with screenshot, like Unit testing is kind of built in in Rust, and so that's okay. But anything a bit more sophisticated, error reporting, all those kinds of things. But we'll get to that with debugging too. But um, and then the other thing that might be tricky is they have a lot of different backends, right? And so that can more easily lead to uh, cross-platform bugs. Um, and especially having different GPU backends, um, it's kind of notoriously hard to get that right. Or like you have lots of uh, weird edge cases. So... I think that they have a long ways to go to go here, um, but it, it can be done, right? Like it just takes time and effort basically. And then the debugging I think is pretty good, right? Like I mentioned that, oops, um, in terms of testing and so on, there's uh, a bunch to be desired. 
Uh, but the stack, is, uh, the stack is quite simple to understand, right? And that gives them a huge advantage. Um, so if you find a bug in the uh, somewhere in the rendering, there's only a few files you typically have to go through to find uh, where where the bug is, and you don't have to dig through all sorts of different libraries. On the other hand, uh, if you build on more robust libraries, you might not have to uh, do as much debugging in the first place, right? Because um, if you build on top of um, I don't know, browser APIs and so on. Like browsers are very well tested, uh, very robust pieces of software. So I don't know how exactly this this would shake out, you know, this robustness versus, uh, and debugging trade-off in some sense, right? Like where the stack is simple, but uh, they are reinventing a lot of things. Um, but um, in, my, in my experience, so so far the debugging has been has been pretty easy, and you can use existing native debugging tools, right? So um, uh, debugging in WebAssembly is a little bit harder in general. Uh, the tooling is just not as great there yet. But for native, you can just use you know all all the tools that already exist for Rust, and they might be able to you know add more specific debugging tools for um, uh, for kind of their component system. Uh, that they're working on, but already the status quo, I think, is, uh, is, is not too bad at all. And then mobile is a little bit uh, interesting in this case. They are not focusing on it at all, but it seems like a pretty natural extension. There's no real reason, I think, as far as I could find, why you couldn't kind of write, you know, two more backends, one for iOS, one for Android. And so that seems like it could... Um, it could work, but they're not focused on it right now. So overall, I think it might be hard to find a niche of performance critical applications, right? Where sort of like the downsides that I mentioned here are acceptable. So they, they, have, they have some ways to go, I think. Um, but there might be still some people for whom it's compelling enough to use this, even though you have a bunch of these downsides. So that is interesting. So then there's some variants I can see, right? So um, you could take MakePad and go in a slightly different direction with it, or you know, the MakePad people themselves could do something like this. Um, and so one of them is maybe a little bit forward-looking, right? So if we look at WebGPU, um, a quite interesting picture emerges. So imagine that Web WebGPU is uh, completely implemented on the uh, on the web, and for those who aren't familiar, WebGPU is basically roughly a um, an implementation of Vulkan. Vulkan is a graphics API that is su supposed to, um, I don't know, be, be like a sort of a modern replacement for OpenGL, um, and which is looking like it's fairly well supported cross-platform, hopefully. Um, it has like a single shader language, um, and so on. And so WebGPU in some sense is very similar to that. Uh, and what is quite nice, especially in Rust, is there's uh, a set of libraries um, uh, kind of um, uh, around implementing WebGPU where you can also use um, basically the WebGPU API within Rust. And because, you know, like for browsers like Firefox, they needed that anyway, but they have like Rust bindings for that as well. So that is quite attractive because that means that you know you write your shaders once and um, you write uh, your backend like once or maybe twice, but twice in a very similar way, right? Like once in JavaScript uh, to bind your WebAssembly application to WebGPU, and uh, in the other case, you can use uh, WGPU RS directly. So um, and maybe at some point there will even be sort of automatically generated bindings for WebAssembly from this. Uh, I don't think that that quite exists, but uh, yet. But um, then you could literally just have one backend for the graphics part at least. So, of course, in the short term, this is not going to work because WebGPU isn't really released yet, right? The progress is being made quite quickly, and you could already do the uh, WGPURS part, probably. I don't know how stable that, that is yet, but that seems uh, promising at least. And so that could help, I think, with a robustness metric, right? Like you're building, uh, you only have one backend, which is a lot easier to maintain. You don't have maybe as many potential cross-platform bugs because you're building on the same libraries that are being used in browsers, which are very 
robust, stable pieces of software. You have a single shader language. So a lot of, like even though MakePad is quite simple already, uh, the bit of complexity that it, that it has would be reduced substantially. And you would be building on top of uh, uh, existing robust libraries. Or at least, you know, at the point where this, this gets truly released, it will be, become quite robust quite quickly. Um, and then it could also help with the enough APIs metric. Um, at least with things like 3D rendering, um, because, you know, you have the entire WebGPU API for rendering, right? And uh, so you don't have to kind of restrict what the API, the rendering API looks like, um, like, is, uh, like what they're kind of doing today, um, because you don't have to implement anything multiple times. Like you can just, uh, you know, you have to, you can directly expose WebGPU, uh, WebGPU's APIs. Um, and so that is quite nice. So then another approach would be to say, okay, let's, let's look at another direction. So, um, you could take MakePad and say, let's forget about, um, well, not, not forget about, but we talked about, um, the backwards compatibility, right? And we said that, that that's currently only sort of doable in the WebAssembly target. Well, you could also get it on native targets, um, by adding some sort of web view, right? So this means like um, including a browser, but not in the electron way, right? It, it means like actually linking against uh, a browser code. There's various libraries to do this. And that way you can have backwards compatibility both in your WebAssembly target and natively. Uh, and that could help a lot uh, for adoption, right? It could supersede um, both web apps and apps that target electron and so on. The only thing that seems tricky here is to get the APIs consistent between native and, and WebAssembly, right? Because natively you have to go sort of like through uh, the browser that you're embedding. In WebAssembly, you are, your code is actually embedded in, like, they're very different pathways. And so you have to um, sort of abstract that away f uh, for the user, which means that you might have to just implement a lot of different APIs and make sure that they, to the user, it's just, um, um, yeah, they, they, they don't need to know if the code is running on WebAssembly or, or, or natively. Um, and so that might be tricky just for, um, yeah, to, to get that working well. It might, might be, you know, setting back robustness and debugging a little bit. I'm not sure if this would work on mobile, um, how well web views work there. And if you can kind of, you know, layer the backwards compatibility code, right? Like the, the DOM code with the, uh, or like the DOM rendering easily with the, uh, um, the GPU based graphics rendering. So I haven't looked too much into that. So it's kind of an interesting idea, but I think it might be, yeah, there might be too many downsides. And then there's another way. And this is quite interesting to me um, because it kind of also relates to what I, you know, one of my original goals. So one of my original goals was I said I wanted to make a um, Rails for WebAssembly, right? And I was really thinking about WebAssembly first. And so you could do that, so, right? You could take something like MakePad, but say, okay, let's just throw away all the backends that are not WebAssembly and just keep WebAssembly. And then for, if you do want a native app and you do want to target native APIs, you use Electron for that. So it seems like a little bit of a step back, right? And it feels that way, but it might be in the short term, at least not a bad option. And it's actually similar to what Figma does. I talked to some folks at Figma and um, this is, yeah, they, they have essentially an Electron app. And so this is great, right? Um, it's, um, you get the backwards compatibility like natively as well, because everything, yeah, when you have like a native app, it just uses electrons or chips or browser. Uh, it's great for APIs because like you can implement stuff very easily, right? Because you can just use the web APIs everywhere. You can use the native APIs to electron. All of this is very well known, very well understood. It's great for robustness, right? Because you don't have so many rendering engines. Uh, you don't have to worry about, um, 
other you know native APIs aside from uh, using using them through Electron. Uh, you're building on very stable libraries and software, right? Like the browser, Electron, all of, and you know libraries within there are very mature. Uh, but you know it regresses on native performance, right? That's that's the main thing. So we're basically saying like, okay, uh, we're okay with this in the short term, even though we know that we're not getting, you know, the, we're not squeezing out the last bit of juice. Right, like we're still shipping a browser in the native case using Electron. We're still using WebAssembly, uh, even on uh, on native targets, which is just slower, right, than uh, compiling directly for the, for the right targets. If you combine it maybe with WebGPU, um, it could be it could be a little bit more attractive because at least that that is you know generally faster than WebGL. Um, there's a little bit, yeah. Like it really, it kind of depends on the application, but it, in general, it's a little, it's a little bit faster. You know, may, maybe Electron will have better support for Wasm, so that you can do maybe some ahead of time compiling or optimizations. So, you know, may, maybe it can approach what is make what MakePad is doing now uh, over time in a more robust way. Um, but you're definitely saying, okay, we're not going to get the full performance. But that's the thing, right? Like maybe. You know, MakePad. Well, MakePad, MakePad's current approach is incredibly ambitious, and um, maybe it would just uh, maybe it's just too ambitious in some sense, right? Like maybe the juice is not quite worth the squeeze, right? So th this might be an interesting short-term solution. Um, yeah, some other things is it might be worse for debugging, right? Because you can't use the native debuggers anymore. You could keep maybe a native target just for debugging purposes. Um, or like yeah, a partial backend that doesn't have like the backwards compatibility part. But if you're just if you just want to debug something that is purely in Rust, then it might be useful to still have at least one native backend. Uh, yeah, hard to say if if that is uh, useful. Um, and then for mobile, I'm not quite sure. So um, that seems maybe easier with the original approach. Um, Maybe you can use this, use Cordova here, which is kind of like Electron for mobile. I haven't really used that. Um, yeah, hard, hard to say if that would work. Uh, and then one thing that is appealing about this is you could also start with this and then iterate, re uh, replace more and more JavaScript and DOM. And then at some point when you don't have any JavaScript and DOM stuff left, maybe you can bring back the old backend from MakePad, and maybe they have at that point kind of matured enough that you can use that for production. Um, so that's interesting. And then another thought that I had is, uh, you know, since I was thinking about notebook applications and stuff like that, if you need just-in-time code generation, right? If you need sort of like in-app um, compilers, then this might be a good choice because you don't have to, you know, you can just it's fairly easy to generate little pieces of WebAssembly. Um, you know, if you don't want like a full Rust compiler or something, if you don't need that, but if you um, just need to generate like little pieces of code here and there, and that's relevant for WebFizz because WebFizz uh, kind of needs to do that. So that's interesting. Okay, so then another way to focus, right? So um, in the previous one, we focused on just WebAssembly. You could also focus just on mobile, right? So that might be interesting just from a business perspective because there might be more companies that have a direct need for something for for high performance uh, uh, GUI uh, GUI libraries on mobile, right? Because uh, you just run into performance constraints much more quickly on uh, low power devices. It would be a substantial pivot to do for the MakePad people themselves. But it might help them. Uh, like it, it's, I think it's an interesting approach for them to consider because it could make things a lot more focused. Uh, or someone else can do this, right? Uh, yeah, like I said, might be easy to find a niche here. Um, there's maybe less of a concern of backwards compatibility, at least with JavaScript and the DOM in that case. Um, and so if you were to do this, right, um, you'd be competing head-on with Flutter. But it would be faster. Um, um, 
and it would have support for 3D rendering, there might be other benefits there as well. So my overall assessment, right? Like what, what should we do, right? So the first one, make pad, uh, but only targeting WebAssembly, that seems very appealing to me, right? It seems like you can get a lot of adoption that way from existing users of, um, of the web. Uh, and they can kind of iterate their way out of it um, and eventually go to, you know, what, what, what the current vision of MakePad is kind of. And then uh, MakePad but only targeting mobile seems also a super interesting option, but I just don't, don't understand that market super well. Um, but there might be something there. And then longer term, I think, you know, using MakePad, but using the web, web GPU and WGPU RS, that seems like um, just, just a, you know, almost a strict win, right? Like maybe you're paying a little bit for that translation layer, but it seems very minimal. Um, and so like long-term, this seems just great um, for reducing complexity in the application. So yeah, if you don't need any backwards compatibility and you're going to build your application fully, uh, so if using the MakePad model, then at least this would uh, simplify things a little bit, I think. And then the thing that I'm most uncertain about is, like I said, the backwards compatibility using web views. I just don't really, like it seems fairly complex to me, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm um, sort of overestimating that, right? Maybe it's easier than I think. So it might be worth playing with that a little bit more. And then another thought that I had is I still don't actually know how to make any money with this, <laughs> right? So MakePad's current approach is to offer paid developer tools. Um, that is a notoriously hard market. Um, they, you know, might be able to, I don't know, compete a little bit with the likes of Figma, or I think that is kind of their plan if they if they can offer sort of a, you know, a, n a nice interface builder that also feels a little bit like a design tool, like that, I don't know. I don't know if that is a great fit. Um, so basically my best guess is here is like, okay, you can uh, you do what the C++ in gaming people do, uh, which is to sell the library or like, you know, license, like dual license it with a GPL and a commercial license, right? Like, I don't know how well that would fly in the web world, but, um, you know, if you build a good enough product, then people will have, um, you know, will be willing to pay for it. Um, the problem here is that I could see, you know, a Google or a Facebook or something basically just releasing a free library for a lot of the stuff that we're doing here, right? Like they're offering Flutter for free as well. Um, but you know, if if you build enough and if it's like hard enough to to duplicate, and if you build sort of enough tools around it, then maybe it, maybe it is viable. Um, what might be better though is to is to kind of build um, other specialized tooling around it, right? So like CI, build, analytics, error logging. So things that require more of a server component, because um, that is where people are currently spending substantial amounts of money. Um, people who are currently, you know, using the web stack. Um, so that, uh, that, that might be an interesting model to look at. But I think, I think overall it will still be a pretty tough space. Um, but you know, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do something here, right? I, I still think that there's something important here. So yeah, that is, that is kind of my assessment here. So let's just take a step back. And um, and reflect on the goals that I set, um, or those those were kind of you know my broad ideas that I set uh, set out to explore in my uh, original video. So the first idea was Rails for WebAssembly, and I'm not sure if I've quite found it, but um, I really think that the MakePad people are onto something, even though the scope is bigger than you know just targeting Web uh, WebAssembly. But maybe if you focus, like I said, MakePad to just use WebAssembly, you could sort of make it really good and you would kind of have a real sort of WebAssembly in some sense, right? Um, it's very focused on 
the graphical user interface part of it, but I think that is sort of the biggest gap now anyway. Uh, WebFist me Jupyter, right, like my notebook idea. Just haven't found a really great angle for this. Uh, I don't know quite what to build. Like the observable people seem to have built like a pretty good product, um, which uses JavaScript, um, but a lot of people use WebGL in it. Um, and it seems, you know, plenty fast for most applications. I don't know if there's, yeah, something, something great that I can add here. Um, research into different programming languages has been interesting, right? Like I, I've discovered that I do like Rust quite a lot. Um, and the experimental programming languages, I think that there's some really great ideas. Um, I don't know if any of them, like when they will be ready for prime time. I've seen kind of from Rust now how much work it takes to really bring a language um, from uh, from the initial stages, even if you know you actually use it for production type products, it still takes quite a while to uh, for language to become just broadly useful for lots of different applications. Um, and then the universal language interop interoperability. I've made no progress on this really. Um, I mean, I learned a little bit about how to dynamically generate uh, like compile stuff and then in uh, import it in like um, include it in a running program so like all that yeah dy dynamic program running uh, i learned a bit about but nothing nothing close to to what i was thinking about here so yeah so for my next steps i'm currently talking to a bunch of companies to continue working on this in one way or another right like there's some companies that have a use for high performance um uh, graphical user interfaces and so uh, I might be able to um, actually apply some of my learnings in a real-world setting. Um, if that doesn't work out, or maybe if, even if it does, I might actually, you know, sort of pursue this Rails for WebAssembly idea, right? Like either using MakePad as a basis or starting from scratch. I just think that there's something interesting there um, that could uh, that could see pretty pretty quick adoption, right? Especially if it was really focused on uh, enabling backwards compatibility with existing JavaScript uh, code, you know, DOM-based applications. Uh, yeah, and besides that, I'm moving back to the Bay Area. Um, I'm not sure if I'll continue these videos, right? It really depends on where I end up working, like exactly what I'll be working on, like how much I can share about that, if it will be useful for me still to kind of share share that. I've definitely enjoyed making these videos just both for myself and just to get feedback from um, uh, from people here and there. Um, but you know, if I don't end up making uh, making more videos, uh, thanks a lot for, for everyone who's been watching uh, watching my videos so far and I uh, hope, hope it's been useful and you know, I'll certainly make other videos about all sorts of topics in the past, uh, and maybe even even about this uh, still, if uh, if I continue working on this. Yeah. So with that, thanks a bunch, and um, see you around.